From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. For more than 60 years, Roger Williams University has been a part of Rhode Island's higher education landscape, and since 1993, it has boasted the only law school in the state. Previous President Donald Farish passed away in 2018. Now just two months on the job, newly minted President Giannis Mialis is beginning his tenure at the Bristol campus. What is his vision for the university, and how can the school play a role in making higher education more affordable? Our guest this week on the first half of Newsmakers, Roger Williams University President Giannis Mialis. Then, it remains the talk of the State House. Should IGT get another 20 year contract from the lottery? Joining us on the second half, two lawmakers who've listened to hours of testimony on the proposal State Senators Ryan Pearson and Lou De Palma. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, as always, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. Dr. Giannis Mialis, president of Roger Williams University, it's good to have you in the program. Good to be here. And welcome to Rhode Island. Thank you. So uh, some people might not know, before coming to Rhode Island, people probably think you were in higher education or came to higher education from higher education. You were actually president and director of the Boston Museum of Science since uh, 2003. Prior to that, you were, I believe, dean of engineering at Tufts University, provost there. Uh, but from Boston Museum of Science to Roger Williams University seems kind of a, like an interesting leap. What drew you to the university to say yes to this job? Well, at heart, I've always been an academic. Uh, the reason I left academia and I went from Tufts to the museum is because I had a passion to introduce engineering in the lives of young children. Uh, actually, I was one of the first people that worked on the whole STEM thing. It was science and math, and I introduced the E mm -hmm. of STEM. And I worked with then Governor Cassieri uh, to uh, introduce it in Rhode Island as, uh, as well. Uh, so I worked 16 years at the museum. My mission was accomplished. Engineering now is part of the lives of children all over the world. We introduced engineering into the lives of 20 million children. And it was time to come back to academia. Uh, so I informed my board that I'm leaving and then uh, took a little break. And Roger Williams approached me and I was intrigued uh, by the university. And although I, I could have had a two year sabbatical leave, I pretty much quit my sabbatical leave and started working there in August. And the university's building a uh, school of engineering, right? If you drive by the campus, there's construction going on right now. And, and when people see that, that is an engineering school that they're looking at, right? Yes, the, the engineering school has been in operation for many years. But this is a fabulous new facility that the university is building. A uh, state-of-the-art facility that will include engineering and construction management and computer science. Was that a magnet to you because you're you're an engineering guy? Um, I'm, I'm guessing that was uh, in the works before you got there. Uh, it was in the works. Uh, of course, I was thrilled that there is a fabulous new facility for engineering, but I was attracted by the university primarily by a, a statement that Roger Williams will be the university the world needs now. I thought it was a fabulous statement. And when I look closely, I realize that indeed it's a university that it has the potential to be the university the world needs now because of uh, the multitude of schools it has, a uh, combination of professional schools with excellent liberal arts, an excellent law school, uh, an urban campus in Providence, and, and a suburban campus in Bristol. Um, and, and emphasis on civic scholarship, which sets it apart from many other schools. So, as you know, uh, we've been seeing some financial challenges in the higher education sector. We've seen some schools closing in Massachusetts, some of them pretty unexpectedly. And so we've been starting to keep track of data on the colleges. And uh, I wanted to ask you, we, some of the federal data showed a drop in Roger Williams endowment over the last 10 years. Um, first of all, is that is that accurate, that it's, it's down since 2007, 2008? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I don't know what the endowment was. Uh, our endowment is, is small. Uh, it's uh, over $70 million. Um, and, uh, and one of the things I would like to change is the whole culture of philanthropy for the institution. It's a relatively young school. Mm -hmm. So 30% of our alumni uh, graduated the last 10 years. So they have not built the wealth that you typically find in, in older schools. But uh, we're going to work on it. Mm -hmm. And then more broadly, uh, how do you feel about uh, Roger Williams' financial health in general uh, right now when you look at you know, the challenges other schools have faced? I have to think it was, it's, a, it's a top concern for a college president right now. It, it's doing better and better. Uh, one of the challenges we had is that uh, uh, the, the, we, we froze tuition, the university froze tuition for a number of years uh, while they keep getting raise, giving raises to faculty and staff. So the income pretty much stayed the same and the expenses increased. 
uh, and now we have reversed that. So we're, we're back in, on track to be financially sound. When, when you say you reverse that, does that mean the university has no longer frozen tuition? We will still uh, uh, grant the freezing, frozen tuition for students that were already uh, promised that, but as new classes come in, we'll just uh, increase tuition, not significantly, still will be a very affordable institution, but to be in pace with, with inflation and, and, and other expenses. One of the uh, uh, legacies of, of your predecessor, Don Farish, was in the tuition freeze program, if a fresh uh, when a freshman came in, excuse me, that tuition would stay the same for that four years. Is that is that part of what you, is that not sustainable anymore? No, it's not sustainable. And and I think it's far more important that we deliver quality programs and, and a great experience for the students than just save a few hundred dollars over the four years. Overall, and I'm not going to ask you to solve this problem, but college students. Uh, and their debt is so high in this country, and particularly in Rhode Island. Um, we are the fourth highest state for college debt in this country. Uh, average debt when a student graduates is $36,000 a year. Again, I don't expect you to have the answer here on this program, but what do you think can be done? What's your overall thought about college uh, debt? Uh, the challenge uh, that all colleges face is that most of their expenses are uh, salaries people's salaries and, and uh, faculty members and staff members expect raises and uh, expect raises typically above inflation so unless a university has substantial endowment in place to, to subsidize tuition the, 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 then the tuition would go up you know as, as, as raises go up uh, however the Roger Williams has managed to keep expenses down so our tuition is much less than most of the universities that of, of the same caliber of, of Roger Williams uh, but it is a challenge for universities. Well, one of the uh, other challenges I've heard a lot about lately from friends who work uh, in higher ed in this region, outside the Ivy Leagues, is uh, this demographic cliff. This uh, People are saying that coming in around the mid-2020s, you're going to see a sharp drop-off in the number of uh, kids going to college from the Northeast, and a lot of the, s the smaller institutions and medium-sized institutions in this region pull regionally from the Northeast. How concerned are you about that, and sort of how are you planning for that when there's a, a, s a significant change coming in the demographics? Um, I think there are two ways to, to uh, resolve that, this issue, uh, keeping costs down and also having programs that uh, are very attractive to students, that would draw students beyond uh, the region. Uh, also, we want to make sure that we uh, were a very welcoming campus for uh, people from all backgrounds and ethnicities and races because the, the, the demographic profile is also changing. So if you have a campus that's very inviting to, to children or to, to students from uh, all backgrounds, you have a diverse curriculum and, and rich curriculum and you keep costs down, then you remain competitive. This year our applications were up 7 percent, almost schools of our kind uh, have seen a decline. What, um, what's, what's, I'm curious with what sort of student interest is changing. What's growing as a major, as an interest from the students? The correct answer to this is journalism. Actually, we have a fabulous program in journalism <laughs> yes, and a I, super professor. That yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, one of the adjuncts sitting here. Um, but uh, I hope none of them are going to journalism since there's no, going to be no jobs in 10 years, it looks like. <laughs> That's but, not true. <laughs> but uh, what are you seeing more students enroll in? What are you seeing shrink or, or not, uh, not attracting as many students? Kind of what are the trends as you look at what students want to major in these days? We've seen a growth in most professional programs. Uh, however, we want to keep a robust uh, liberal arts, humanities and arts program because I believe that no matter what your education uh, is and what your job is going to be, unless you have a good, good grounding in humanities and uh, social science and arts, then you're not really well educated. Mm. And we have seen interest in, in, in many, many areas. Engineering is, is up and architecture has always been very strong. Marine biology has been a signature program. But uh, throughout the university, we have seen, uh, we have seen uh, incre increased interest. The university has uh, community-centered programs, uh, Housing Works Rhode Island, the Latino Policy Institute, the Center for Justice. The university has partnered with WPRI in political polling uh, in, uh, in the most recent election cycle. Um, that was a big focus for your, your predecessor there, was those community-centered, public-facing uh, outlets. But, you know, the university puts itself out there when it gets involved in, in those programs. Is it a net positive for the school and do you s continue seeing the school uh, being involved in those programs? Yes, it's a net positive both financially and educationally. 
Uh, we have a fabulous campus in Providence, which houses our university college and, and part of our law school. And we have, like you mentioned, a number of programs that serve uh, the community, both Providence and Rhode Island, and, and, and some of our national scope programs. Uh, in addition, in Bristol, we have a very strong focus on civic engagement of students. Uh, we have one of the best uh, civic uh, engagement programs in the country, and, and this is a program that I'm planning on growing and making hopefully a requirement for all students. So when you come to Roger Williams, you get a great education, but then you, you, you get embedded in the community and you help the community you become a, a responsible citizen. One thing we're seeing enormous growth in is online higher education. People seeking degrees in, uh, you know, by, by taking classes, some of them purely online, some of them very far away from the, if there is a campus, a headquarters. How, do you, how are you thinking about that? You know, we, I think of Roger Williams, I think of Bristol, I think of the campus, I think of, you know, kids walking around in backpacks and sweatpants. But uh, wh how do you look at it for looking at online? How does it play into your strategy? Um, online is and is going to be increasingly a big part of education, which I think is fine. Some of the things that uh, we used to be, used to be taught in a classroom, in a big classroom lecture hall, could be done online. However, there are other things that you cannot get online, and that's interaction with students, your classmates, uh, engaging with students from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, uh, working with faculty members to create new knowledge, working in undergraduate research, which is big in our university and it's growing, and, and also the, the social life in the university. That's when you become independent and you, and, and, and you grow up. Uh, I went to Tufts as an undergraduate, and I would say 50% of what I gain is my education at Tufts, but 50% is getting acclimated in the in becoming an adult in an environment where I was independent uh, and uh, meeting people from all over the world. You, as I started this conversation, you came from uh, Boston Museum of Science, uh, previously Tufts University, so it's not like it was a million miles away, but. Did you interact much with Rhode Island, and what was your impression of this state prior to coming here? So I have been coming to Rhode Island since I was 26 years old. Uh, I love to fish, <laughs> and, uh, and I used to trailer my boat and put it in Allen's Harbor, which is by, by uh, Wickford, near mm -hmm. Wickford. So I've known Rhode Island very well from the water side. <laughs> uh, from the land side, uh, uh, I have been engaged in introducing engineering uh, for in K-12, so I have been giving a num number of talks. Um, and Rhode Island was always one of my favorite uh, states, so I'm, I'm thrilled. And uh, Bristol is just a fabulous community to live, absolutely fabulous. All right, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the Twin River IGT fight from the perspective of two lawmakers. Our guests will be Senators Ryan Pearson and Lou De Palma. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, and that you are looking at State Senator Lou De Palma, who's one of our guests. He's also joined by State Senator Ryan Pearson, who's immediately to my right. This is Ted Nisi. We're going to be talking about IGT and Twin River. Probably been seeing a lot of headlines on that on WPRI.com and elsewhere and advertisements. It's a big kerfuffle happening up at the State House. So I wanted to get your temperature right now. And Senator Pearson, I'll, I'll start with you. If the vote were today, would you vote for or against the IGT deal? Yeah. So I think the key thing for Rhode Islanders to know is our job is to be looking at what's in their best interest. And for IGT, they're certainly out there and advocating for their best interests and their interests of their shareholders. And Twin River's doing the same. Um, we've had both parties in. We've allowed them to make their case. Um, we still have one more hearing left to go. And so I don't want to prejudge the outcome. Um, I think both sides have brought um, very compelling cases, and ultimately we need to make the best decision for Rhode Island. All right, so Senator Pearson would not bite on my question. He wouldn't say, <laughs> if he, are you leaning one way or another before I go to Senator De Palma? I, I wouldn't say I am. I, I, think, I think both sides have valid Come on, issues. you have to have an opinion. <laughs> you, the pendulum must be in one yeah, camp or I think I think IGT certainly brings employment, and they bring stability to the system. I think Twin Rivers brought some very legitimate concerns around the VLT machines. I think there is a way to get to it and, and compromise on the issue, but prejudging that, I honestly can't tell you that today. Senator De Palma? So there won't be a yes or no to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. I would expect, you wouldn't expect otherwise, I wouldn't think. Uh, as Senator Pearson indicated, we've had right now it's up to 19 hours of hearings. On, through the four hearings that we had, 19 hours. Cases have been made on both sides by all the folks that we've had uh, testify. We still have another N number of hours. I'm not going to say how many because I don't know. On Tuesday for public comment to be made. And we, we, we really need to see where it's going to go. Prior to the announcement, by Twin River with bringing scientific games into the mix, uh, that that tipped the scale to say we need to really look at this. So that that helped Twin River's argument. That announcement was made, I believe, this week. Categor that helped uh, categorically. 
I, I, that was made publicly. I, I said that publicly last night. It made their their deal made come more credible. If it was credible before, but based on that and based on the facts and the data of the landscape in the United States. Before we get to you, Ted, does, is there any concern uh, for you that Twin River is doing sort of a patchwork of companies to put together a deal that might be enticing to Rhode Island as opposed to one single company in IGT that could handle it? Is there any concern about Absol that? Absolutely not. I've seen that in the uh, defense world where companies will come to the table. You get the best of breed and you also eliminate and ameliorate potential risks that may manifest themselves. And we talked about the UHIP doing one big bang for a system. You potentially look at the piece parts of this. You bring the best to the table. The future, you potentially can just recompete the lottery machines separately. And, and the complication around that, right? And so I think Senator Palmer brings out the complication of all the different pieces and components that we're talking about here. And that was one of the big things through our hearing that we just had last evening that we really got into was how complicated each of those bidders are that could potentially pull that together, but also how complicated is the, the deal is in and of itself. And we did get to talk Just to, to remind people, yeah. just briefly, uh, Senator, but we're talking about the underlying technology mm -hmm. that, that spits out the scratch tickets, keeps yeah. track of everything, as well as uh, a large number of the slot machines at the casinos. It's, it's kind of all the tech backbone yeah. of yeah. gambling in Rhode Island. Yeah, I think there's three basic components of it, right? There's the system that runs the actual Kino daily numbers, right? That comes out, and that's a big technology system. There's a second system that runs all of the VLT machines or the slot machines throughout all the Twin River casinos. And the third element is those actual slot machines, where do they come from? And those are sort of the three components of it, right? And I think at the end of the day, when you look at it, um, there are legitimate advantages that IGT brings on the technology backbones, but Twin River does have legitimate concerns around the percentage of VLTs. And we got into the complications of it, and I did say to them last night, I said, so this is more complicated than bid or no bid, and you would agree to that, and Twin River even agreed to that, um, and also would say that they were not open to us putting their own contract out to bid. You know, Twin River has their own 25-year quote unquote, and I don't like the term, but no bid deal. Um, and I think that it's really important for Rhode Islanders to understand each side is putting out a message that they want Rhode Islanders to understand in sound bites. Our job is to really look at what's in the best interest for Rhode Islanders. I want, and I want to follow up with you, Senator, on uh, what Senator Pearson said, which is it, it does seem like one thing that's come out in these hearings, if you're trying to trying to listen judiciously, is maybe IGT has gotten a little, you know, fat and happy over the years with a 20-year contract, and and uh, Twin Rivers argued is not refreshing the games at the casinos as often as necessary. The lottery, just in the midst of all this, suddenly took some of their games away. Do you think uh, this has sort of helpfully shined a spotlight on whether Rhode Island's getting maximum value? Categorically. And uh, Senator Pearson brought up last night, and as we've seen through the hearings, these hearings would not have happened, did not need to happen. Had the state agreed to, and if you look at the numbers and the Massachusetts numbers that we heard last night and we've seen before regarding the share of VLTs and who provides those, had that number been brought down to maximum of 50% from one company, this would have been done. Mm -hmm. Categorically, would have been done. But now, and I m indicated this last night, with Twin River bringing scientific games to the table, it opened up the aperture to say, wait a minute, let's really look at this. At the end of the day, the words from the governor, best deal for Rhode Island, best deal for Rhode Islanders, and that's what we're doing. And as Senator Palmer mentioned, you know, the Twin River said last night, you know, had the issue on this share of VLTs, to your point, had not been present, they would have never come forward on this larger mm -hmm. deal, right? I think they're putting together this larger deal because they feel it's their only way to compete. Um, but this is the central issue that seems to be between the two entities. And by the way, it's a good thing for Rhode Islander to have multiple vendors that are competing. What we don't want to do is create, you know, we have two very big, you know, almost monopolies. What we don't want to create is one mega monopoly. And so I, I think really making sure that we have a structure that is, makes sense for Rhode Island and allows competing parties to continually try to drive more revenue for the state that's the right answer, um, and I think we got to figure out how we structure a deal that gets but us But we just, uh, and I was like, Tim, come back, but we asked yeah. Mark Chris Foley from True River that last week on the show yeah. and said, you know, you're talking about no bids and giving too much power to one company, but yeah. if Twin River also ran the technology, yeah. they it seems like they'd really be too big to fail for Rhode Island in the, in the gaming space. They would, and I, I think that's a legitimate concern that we have to have. And I think you know Twin River to themselves is admitting and, and bringing in these other partners um, that there should be some more divergence in, in how that arrangement is done. Um, we also asked them last night about the jobs guarantee um, in, in their proposal. And you know we said, okay, you, you're guaranteeing 1,100 jobs. Are you guaranteeing the $110 million payroll that IGT has? And the answer was quite simple. If the requirement is $110 million in salary guarantees, we're out. 
and we're back to just talking about VLTs. And so it keeps coming back to it seems like that real issue is the percent of VLTs, and I think Twinderver is bringing up an absolutely legitimate concern around that, and so I think that collectively we need to figure out the right path. Well, sticking with the jobs uh, topic here, do you think, Senator De Palma, mm -hmm. it's appropriate that IGT is threatening to uh, move a thousand jobs out of Rhode Island if they don't give give a, uh, if the state doesn't give them this contract? No, they sh they should not be doing. It. I think that's ir I think it's irresponsible. And with regards to the language in the legislation, because that's what we're talking about. The language in the legislation is what we're looking at that provides the. No one wants to say no bid contract, but that's what the legislation does. That's how you do that if you're not going to put it out to bid. It doesn't say 1,100 jobs that are going to equate to over $100 million. That's not in the contract. It's 150% of minimum wage. That's what's, in the, that's what's in the legislation. So when we look at that, they're not committing to $100 million on, on paper. They're not going to sign, the legislation is not going to say that. Or You're saying that. IGT is not committed right. because that's not exactly what's guaranteed in right. the legislation that's not the right now. Right. And so the, the piece with regards to, I want to go back to, I mean, so um, two things, Senator uh, Pearson and I, we're here today. We also share the same office together, and we also sit on the same seats and together. It's a very, very <laughs> intake. Wow. We're yeah, spending way in. too much time yeah. together. Yeah. 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 We, we do. <laughs> but uh, just to go back with regards to the uh, fairness and comment on the, uh, would you put the casino bid out to contract out the bid? The answer is no. It's capital investment. It's, you, you built the building. You went out to the voters and say, this is who we're going to do it. It's going to be in this building. Unless we're going to re, re, uh, recover that, someone's going to recover those costs. It's different than the technology side or the machine side of things. And I, I would also disagree with regards to the technology piece. You might have the contract for 10 years, but these things are rebid across the country all the time. We heard IGT indicate the other day uh, of the 15 or 16, 15 they bid, or 16, they won 11, they lost, they lost five, three to one company, two to somebody else, but they it transitioned from somebody before to them or vice versa. So it happens more than often than you think. But going to what you just said on the casinos, again, thinking about the context of the conversation here, it's been about don't give a company so much power that they can kind of do what they want. If we're saying, don't worry, Twin River, uh, your company built the casinos and it's constitutionally complicated, so we're never going to bid this. How does Twin River feel any uh, pressure? Like we're saying IGT doesn't feel pressure. Why should they ever feel pressure than on their contract? Well, I think the difference is in if you're going to build another one. So I'm, and I've said to, uh, I'm a novice in gambling. I've never supported the bond. Any of the bonds that have been out there for gambling, I've never supported them. I just don't feel that gambling or gaming revenue is the right source to grow the most domestic product in the state of Rhode Island and grow the economy. But that, putting that aside, if you're going to do another one, I'm not saying we should, then that would be open to anybody who wants to do that. Uh, but it's, they're different. We can look at them as saying, well, it's a contract and it's no bid, but they're two different things. They're app we're comparing apples and oranges from a contractual perspective. Curious what you think on that. And I think Senator Palmer raised a good point around, um, you know, successively Republican and Democratic governors, administrations, over decades um, since you and I were probably born. Um, sorry, Tim. Just call uh, you guys. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Jesus. The next question is going to be a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, since that point in time, Republican and Democratic governors, legislatures have handled lottery contracts differently. And that goes into the very nature of, I think, the point that you're bringing up, in that the interest of the state are so high. It is the third largest source of revenue in the state. And by the way, Rhode Island is also different, right? Our tax levy on these casinos, the state owns the casinos, not Twin River. And that's also unique in the industry. And so Rhode Island has a very unique arrangement with casinos that ensures the state gets more revenue, but that also means the state has to have a much more um, tight hand, and it's a lot more complicated than simply putting out components to bid. And uh, I think have, that's an important element. We have about two minutes left. Uh, I'll hit on this quickly. I uh, admittedly have not watched 19 hours of, of testimony. I know Say it's shocking, so. but uh, yeah. look, from what I've seen, these discussions have been about money, 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 money. Yep. And there hasn't been a lot of talk about the social impact of gambling, and the state right. has made it easier for access to gambling with mobile sports betting. Should problem gambling be a part of this conversation in, in yeah. any way. Yeah, I think, I think it's a fair point. Then why hasn't and, it? And you're right. Um, honestly, it just hasn't come up as one of the major topics that either party has brought forward or that any members of ours um, have brought forward. But I do want to remind people you asked the question, so, right? Yeah, it's not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we haven't brought it forward right, either, right. right? And so I, I think it's a fair call out to say that we haven't done it, and it probably is something we should look more into, um, especially as the revenue continues to grow. Um, arguably, there should be more uh, oversight by the state to make sure it's done responsibly. If I, just to follow up on it, I believe yeah. in this most recent budget, some money was part of, we did the sports betting, the online sports betting. Some additional money was 
appropriated. I'll go back and check. I should know the answer to this. I don't. Additional money was appropriated for problem gambling to address that. But it's, I believe it clearly needs to be addressed. I'm stunned you haven't memorized the entire budget. We'll let that go. I apologize. All right, briefly to each of you, will there be a floor vote this yeah. year on the IGT deal? This year? In 2019. I don't, I don't believe we're going back until 2020. I would agree. All right. Uh, this is a very complicated topic, and we actually uh, addressed both sides. We had IGT and Twin River. Was that last week? That was. Man, that feels like five weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so we really got in-depth on this topic, and we have it online, WPRI.com. If you want to learn more, I urge you to go and watch that show. I want to thank our first half guest, Roger Williams. No, wait, University. it wasn't last week. We did the Taunton Mayor debate last week. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks. Thank you. Two weeks ago. Well, you'll see it online. Uh, Roger Williams University President uh, Giannis Mialis. If you missed that, that is also on WPRI.com. Thank you, Senator De Palma and Senator Pearson. And for Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers. Time has... <laughs>